Thankful that you've all joined us for our worship service this morning. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers who are here. We're still celebrating Easter at our church. It's the fourth Sunday of Easter. And every year on the fourth Sunday of Easter, we take the time to talk about one of the most beautiful pictures in the Bible. And that's a picture that God gives us that he is like our shepherd and we're his sheep. And so it's Good Shepherd Sunday. And our, our lessons and our songs will focus on that picture of Jesus as our Good Shepherd we we'll begin by, by reading together our verse of the day. It's on page 4 in your worship folder from John chapter 10, verse 11. Some words from Jesus. Let's read those words together. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So may God bless us as we worship our, our good shepherd today. We'll sing our, our opening song. It's the words of Psalm 23 put into a song. The Lord's my shepherd all not want. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We need a good shepherd, because like foolish sheep, we have too often sinned and strayed away from God and His Word. The Bible says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way. The Bible tells us the hard truth about ourselves and our sins. There is no one righteous. Not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good. Not even one. Same section of the Bible continues. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Pause for a moment of silence. They each privately confess our sins to God.
Our gracious God doesn't leave us sheep without a shepherd. He sent us Jesus. Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for all of our sins. When Jesus rose from the dead, he won eternal life for all who believe in him. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. For as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. May be seated. Join in singing our, our song of praise, 10,000 Reasons. First lesson from God's Word on this Good Shepherd Sunday are the familiar words of Psalm 23. The words that are so well loved that we often read them at every funeral that we have here at our church. A wonderful promise of Jesus being our shepherd in life and in death. Let's join together in reading the words all together. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. 
You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is God's word. Now invite our choir members to come up and to sing another version of that song, The Lord is My Shepherd. Thank you. It's great to have you introduce some, some of those new songs in our new hymnal to us. Please stand now as we read our gospel lesson. Gospel lesson on this Good Shepherd Sunday is from the Gospel of John, chapter 10. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him, saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, 
I did tell you, but you do not listen. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is God's word. You may be seated. That lesson, Jesus calls us his sheep, and that's a good thing. And so we'll sing about that in our next song, I Am Jesus' Little Lamb. During the third verse, the children can come up for our children's devotion. today. Do any of you kids like animals? We really like animals at our house. We like going to the zoo. We've got lots and lots of books about animals. If you could choose to be any animal that you wanted to be, which animal would you choose? A cow. That's interesting. A what? A panda. That'd be cool. A shark? Yeah, that would be pretty fun to be a shark. A jaguar. We like to see the jaguar at the zoo. Anybody else? If you could choose an animal, any animal you wanted to be? Oh, there's some good options. A cow or a shark or a panda or a jaguar. You know, Jesus today calls you an animal. And it wasn't any of those that you mentioned. It wasn't a shark or a jaguar or a panda or even a cow. Have you heard in our service today what Jesus calls you? He calls you a sheep. How many of you say, that's awesome, I've always wanted to be a sheep? Probably not, right? That doesn't sound like the most exciting animal. I think that there's two reasons Jesus calls us sheep. First of all, our sheep really strong and smart and can do everything on their own? No, they're kind of weak. And if we're honest about ourselves, are we kind of weak sometimes and sinful and we do the wrong thing? That's why Jesus doesn't call us sharks. He calls us sheep. But there's a second thing about sheep that's really good. Sheep are never by themselves. Who... Who's always leading sheep around? A shepherd. Sheep always have a shepherd, someone who loves them and cares for them and saves them. Do shark have a shepherd? No. Do jaguars have a shepherd? No, they're kind of all on their own. But sheep 
have a shepherd. And that's why Jesus calls us his sheep, even though we're weak and we're kind of helpless on our own and we sin and we do things wrong. We have a good shepherd who leads us around everywhere. And who's our good shepherd? It's Jesus. Jesus is our good shepherd. And today in our sermon, I want you to listen. We're going to talk about where Jesus leads us to. I bet you could already guess. Where do you think Jesus leads us to? He leads us to heaven. Right? Maybe it doesn't sound exciting when you first hear it, but we're sheep and we have a good shepherd and that's a good thing. Jesus is always with us and he leads us to heaven. Can we say a prayer about that? Let's fold our hands and bow our heads. Dear Jesus, thank you for all the cool animals that you've made. We like to see things like jaguars and sharks and cows and pandas. But Lord, thank you for making us sheep. We know that sometimes we wander, we sin, but you're our good shepherd who loves us, who died for us, and who leads us home to heaven. Help us to always be thankful to be your sheep. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up here. Have a great day. Our final lesson from God's Word and the lesson for our sermon on this Good Shepherd Sunday is from the last book of the Bible, from Revelation chapter 7. Here's what we hear. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not be down on them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is God's word. Dear friends in Jesus, Happy Mother's Day again to all the moms who are here. I hope you realize that you, you matter. I was reading a study a couple years ago about the importance of, of moms. And the study determined that moms are the go-to parent when it comes to counseling and encouragement and advice. Dads, we're, we're preferred to mom in just two areas, according to the study. Finances and logistics, which is a fancy way to say money and cars. That's what we're good for. But moms, you do so many things for us. Hungry? Mom feeds you. Hot or cold? Moms are like the wardrobe experts. Right? Pain? Moms have band-aids for all occasions. And moms don't even demand that there's blood. We dads, there's, there's got to be blood. Otherwise, you don't put a band-aid on, right? But moms, you know just how to care for us. Tears? Moms know how to wipe tears away. I wonder if you could sum up everything that a, a mother is in just one word. Home. Doesn't mom always make you feel like you're at home? You can grow up, you can move a dozen different times to different places, and yet home, for many of us, it's still, it's still where mom is. Mom makes you feel like you're at home. Truth, though, is for a lot of us, we don't 
we don't feel like we're at home. For some of us, mom's not even around anymore. For others of us, we have this longing to, to go back to a better time, right? To go back and be home. Because we don't feel like we're at home. Do you ever find yourselves longing to, to bring back memories from the past? To go back to home the, the way that it, it used to be? And there's a, a fancy word for all that. It's called nostalgia. And wise people say that just about all of us go through life with this longing for something that we, that we never quite get. It's great to get together with family for, for Easter. But it just isn't quite like being at home. But he has to go back to wherever they live. And, and then you start thinking about the next thing, right? And the next thing and the next thing. Because we're always longing for something that we can never quite seem to get. We have this longing to, to be back at home. If anybody had that feeling, I, I bet the Apostle John did. When he wrote Revelation, the last book of the Bible. When John wrote the book of Revelation, it seems like he was an old man. Probably into his 90s. All of his friends were dead. All the other disciples were gone. I'm sure John's mom wasn't around those days any either. To make matters worse, John was in exile for being a Christian on the island of Patmos in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And then maybe you hear that and you say, that doesn't sound so bad. To be in exile on a tropical island? I could go for that. I found it interesting, a couple years ago, there was actually a, a real news story about a man from Austria who ex escaped from prison and he went and he lived on the Canary Islands for 10 years on a tropical island. And after 10 years living on that tropical island, do you know what this man did? He turned himself into police. And you'd say, why on earth would you do that? Living on this tropical island. And do you know what he told the police? He said, it doesn't feel like home. I'd rather go back to jail. You picture John on this tropical island. All he sees all day long is the sea. This big sea that separated him from everyone and everything that he loved. Nostalgia. I bet John had that sometimes. I bet he wished he could go back home. And so one day Jesus showed him home. It just didn't look the way that John expected it to look. He writes, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and they had palm branches in their hands. God was letting John see home. What was he looking at? He was looking at heaven. He sees this great multitude of people there. How many people do you think have believed in the true God over all of the centuries of our world? A lot of people. It's great to be at church when there's 60 of us worshiping together. Can you imagine being in heaven with hundreds and hundreds of millions of, of Christians all wearing white robes and holding palm branches and worshiping God together? And God was saying to John, John... That's home. That's one important detail we better not skip over when it comes to, to being in heaven. Did you catch from where the people in heaven are from? It said every nation, tribe, people, and language. This is so good for us to hear today. In heaven, there's no racism. In our world, there most certainly is racism. Mostly because there's racism that lives in my own heart. My sinful nature thinks that my culture and my race and my way of doing things is better than everybody else's. But notice that the Bible says Jesus didn't come to save people who look like me. Jesus came to die on the cross for the sins of the whole world and heaven is going to reflect that. The more diverse the United States becomes, the more it looks like what heaven is going to look like with people from every nation, tribe, People and language worshiping God and all those people are just the start. John also says that, that all the angels were there. They were there around the throne and the elders and the living creatures and they bowed with their faces to the ground. 
And they said, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. And you're like, wow. The Bible says there's hundreds, there's thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 angels. You just imagine this. Being in this place with thousands and thousands of people all dressed the same, all shouting and singing at the top of their lungs. You ever experienced anything like that? Sounds kind of like a college football game, doesn't it? Only like a, a million times bigger. And it lasts forever. And it's all focused on Jesus. And Jesus always wins. That's our home. Heaven is our home. Would you fit in? That sounds like a strange question I asked. I once was teaching through the book of Revelation to a group of Hispanic ladies. And we, we talked about this section. Revelation chapter 7. The people in heaven all praising God. And I thought it was great. And one of the ladies kind of sheepishly raised her hand and she said, Pastor, that is so scary. You know, as a pastor, I kind of have to try to hide what, what I'm really thinking in my mind sometimes. And I was thinking, what? Scary? I said to her, what, what do you mean, scary? And she said, Pastor, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just worse than everybody else. But I won't fit in. I'm not like that. All these good people and these perfect angels in heaven, I'm not going to be there. It sounds scary. What do you think? She's absolutely right, isn't she? How clean, how perfect are you? Every mistake we make, it's like a stain on our clothes. Every sin, even the ones we try to hide from God, God knows every single one of them. She wasn't worse than the rest of us. The truth is, not a single one of us deserves to stand in the presence of God with the holy angels. Would you fit in? Makes you want to say, how on earth are there people in heaven with white robes? It doesn't make any sense. Where did they come from? And God wants you to know. And so he had one of the elders in heaven, one of the people who's already in heaven, came to John and said to John, these in white robes, who are they and where do they come from? And John said, sir, you know. I bet John was thinking, what are you asking me for? You're the one who's in heaven. You tell me, where do these guys come from? And this elder in heaven, he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The people in heaven aren't the good people. They're not the rich people. They're not the successful people. They are the people who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. But you know, that doesn't make sense either. Moms know that blood doesn't make things clean. Blood stains. Except God tells us exactly the opposite. The place in the Bible where God says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's because our sins are that bad. Our sins are that serious. God says for sins to be taken away, someone needs to die. That means that you can try as hard as you want to, but you can't undo the sins that you've committed. You can try as hard as you, you can to be good, but being good doesn't take your sins away. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's why the Bible tells us that the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. This is the gospel. This is the good news of the Bible, that when Jesus died on the cross, His blood washed all of our sins away, that means you're forgiven. That's why in heaven, there's this great multitude of people. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their clothes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. It's kind of stating the obvious, but I want you to catch one other detail about heaven. One of the questions that people sometimes ask me as a pastor is, Pastor, when do we actually go to heaven? Do we go to heaven right when we die or aren't we going to just kind of sleep and then when Jesus comes back on judgment day, then we'll go to heaven? And you can see the answer in this lesson. As John looks into heaven, 
Whom does he see there? People. People. In white robes and waving palm branches and having a grand old time with Jesus. And what God's telling us is that you're not going to have to wait to go home. When you die with faith in Jesus in your heart, you, you go to be with Jesus right away. There's no waiting. You get to go home. And this is how John describes home and what he sees in his vision. He says they, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He leads them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Doesn't that sound like home? No offense to all the moms who are here today. But Jesus does the things a mom does. Only even better. Jesus fills you so full that you'll never be hungry again. Jesus clothes you so that you'll never be, be hot or cold again. Jesus wipes away the very last tear from your eyes so that you'll never, ever cry again. Isn't that what we want? This feeling of nostalgia that we have, this longing for something, something that we're not quite finding. It's, it's this longing for home. This longing for heaven, isn't that what we want? A number of years ago, when we just had Isaiah and he was a little boy, we, we went on a trip where we drove from where we lived in Minnesota all the way to North Carolina to visit my brother. It was 24 hours in the car. And I remember it well because we were about 45 minutes into the trip when two-year-old Isaiah started asking, Are we there yet? Are we there yet? For 23 hours and 15 minutes. Isn't that exactly what we're like with God? We say to God, are we there yet? I want it right now. Did you hear how that elder in heaven described life on earth? He said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. He's talking about life on earth. The great tribulation, it's true, isn't it? Sin doesn't just stain us. Sin stains our world. Sin stains our lives. If, if ever your life is hard, don't be surprised. This is just what God calls life. He calls it the great tribulation. We're not there yet. And I bet there's moments when you wonder, how are we ever going to make it? How are we ever going to make it through this? I can't do it on my own. And that's where God says, but you're not doing it on your own. He weaves through the Bible this beautiful picture from the Old Testament to the New Testament about God as our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How are we ever going to make it? Because the Lord is my shepherd. I hope you notice there's something upside down about our shepherd. At the end of our lesson from Revelation, it says the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. Do you hear something upside down about that? The lamb will be the shepherd. On earth you will never find someone who is both a lamb and a shepherd at the same time. Right? It's impossible. You don't ever see a little lamb leading Anybody around, knowing the way is so important. Uh, on that trip to North Carolina, we were in the middle of the night. We decided to drive through the night because of all of the, are, the, are we there yet? So we just kept on going. And in the middle of the night, we stopped for gas. And, and little Isaiah woke up and he looked at me and he said, Dad, do you know the way? And I said, yes. And he went right back to sleep. 
Just think about this. The lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. Does Jesus know the way through the great tribulation? Yes, because he's done it himself. Does Jesus know the way, how you make it through death into eternal life? Yes, because Jesus has done it himself. Your shepherd is also the Lamb of God who died for you to take away the sin of the world. Your shepherd is also the one who says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Lamb is our shepherd. That's what gave David, King David, the, the confidence to write at the end of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. To David, that wasn't just some dream. It wasn't some hope. It was true. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God's house is your house. God's house is our home. Every time you get that longing inside of you, every time you get that feeling of nostalgia, just remind yourself it's, it's just because I'm not at home yet. Every tear, every hunger, every thirst, it just reminds you I'm not at home yet, but one day I will be. I know exactly where I'm going. I know exactly who's leading me there. Heaven is my home. So moms, on Mother's Day, Keep on pointing us home. The greatest thing that, that Christian moms can do is to keep pointing all of us to our good shepherd and to our real home. Every time you, you make food for us, remind us that there's someone who will feed us in a way that we will never be hungry again. Every time you help us pick out an outfit, remind us that there is someone will one day clothe us in such a way we will never be cold again. Every time that you wipe away a tear from our eyes, remind us that there is someone who will one day wipe away every last tear for good. And it's Jesus. It's Jesus. And moms, when your kids grow up and they move out of the house, when you sit at, at your home and you feel all alone, remember that, that even your home isn't really home. Because you have a greater home too. You're not home until you see all the white robes and you hear the angels singing and you see the Lamb, Jesus, your Savior. The Lamb is our shepherd and heaven is our home. Amen. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, as we go through life in this world, in this great tribulation, we often have this feeling of longing in our hearts. We long to be at home. We think to the past of memories you've given us with our mothers or fathers at home, and sometimes we long that we could recreate those memories in our lives today. But we can't. We constantly look forward to this or that, to this thing or that thing, but it never quite fills us the way that we want it to. In all this, dear Jesus, you're reminding us that our home isn't a place we can find here on earth. Our home is to be with you in heaven. Thank you for giving us this vision today of our true home. This place where we're going to be with you. This place where there's no hunger or thirst or tears or pain. Dear Lord Jesus, as we go through our, our lives on this world, fill us with a longing for our true home. For our home with you in heaven. And one day, by your grace... Through your leadership as our shepherd, may you take us there to be with you. In your name we pray. Amen. Now confess our faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please stand as we confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. 
and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May be seated. You know, in each of our services, we encourage each other to, to give our offerings generously to God. But a couple of people comment that we don't always communicate very well how much in offerings we receive or, or what that goes for. If you notice in, in your worship folder today, I've added a little paragraph just with some numbers in it. And some people like numbers. Some people numbers aren't very helpful for. But you notice in that little paragraph that this past week, our offerings were $4,757. And we appreciate your generous gifts here to our ministry. If you're interested on a weekly basis to support just what we do as a church, we need about $4,404 a week just to carry out our, our, our regular ministry here at Christ the King. The cumulative totals for the year are there too. As of April 30th, we've received about $65,000 in offerings. Um, our need, if you add up those $4,400 a week, it would be about $76,000 in the same time period. And so those are the, the, the types of needs that we have as a congregation. And your offerings, that $4,400 a week, that's what it, it costs to, to have me as your pastor, to have our church building and to carry out our ministry. And so may God continue to move all of us to, to generously give our gifts to support God and His work here at our church. We're going to go to our, our God now with our, our prayer of the church. We've got a number of people in our church to pray for, and we'll say a prayer for our, our mothers today on Mother's Day too. Please stand as we go to God in, in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, you are our good shepherd. You not only lead us and guide us through life, but you also love us so much that you gave up your life for us, your sheep. It's you who cleanses us and forgives us and who leads us home to heaven. It's trusting in your grace and your love for us that we pray for a number of people in our congregation today. We say a prayer for, of thanks for, for Mark Smith. It's great to, to be able to have him with us today. He's been in and out of the hospital a lot lately. We're thankful that you got him back home. He's able to be with us here at church. We pray, Lord, that the different episodes that he's been having, that they not return. That you give him health and strength for each day. That you allow him to be with us to worship you. Pray for our member, John Christ, who goes in for surgery this Friday, May 13th. Dear Lord, we're thankful that the surgery is possible. We ask that you guide the surgeons who are carrying it out. We pray that it would be a blessing to John and to his health. Keep, us, keep him safe as they put him under. Uh, protect him, his body, and his mind. And restore him again to, to health and to being with us here at church. We say a prayer of thanks for our friend here at church, Austin Schweinert, who graduated from the University of Tulsa yesterday. We're thankful for guiding and blessing Austin through his studies here in Tulsa. We're also thankful for all the Sundays that he came and joined with us here at our church. We're glad that his graduation isn't the end. He's going to be back for one more semester to play soccer again. We're thankful for what he's accomplished, and we ask that you bless him in whatever plans you have in the future for Austin. Finally, Lord, on Mother's Day, we thank you for our, our mothers. Um, it's a wonderful blessing you give to women to be able to give birth to children, to get that title of, of mom. We thank you for the moms you put in our lives, for how they feed us and, and close us and care for us. Even more, we thank you for all the mothers who've pointed us to you, who've read us Bible stories, who've taught us to say prayers, who've brought us to church. And now, even when we're growing, that they keep pointing us to our Good Shepherd. We ask that you give our, our moms health. May you give them the satisfaction of, of knowing their purpose and their meaning in life. And most of all, one day, may you guide them home to be with you in their real home in heaven. Pray all this in the name of Jesus, who's taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. 
Amen. We go today with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Maybe seated. We'll sing one more song. It's two verses of the, the hymn, Jerusalem the Golden. Just, just one note, and this is good to know whenever you read the Bible. The Bible often talks about heaven and gives it the title Jerusalem. So as we sing this song, we're not singing about some city in the Middle East. We're, th we're singing about our home, the Jerusalem in heaven that's waiting for us. Let's join and sing that song together.